we're not taught how to be in a relationship and to be in a healthy relationship. So if you're not seeing that directly modeled because of people that you are fortunate enough to have in your life, you just plain don't get it. Mm -hmm. And so you're going into these relationships as adults and you have no manual because they don't really make one. And so you All right, three, two, one. Hi, Risa. Nice to see you again. Hi, nice to see you also. Yeah, so I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, and I know your insights will be so helpful for this audience. Um, so you can you can start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do. Absolutely. So my name is Risa Morala, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, and I practice um, in California as well as nationwide um, doing um, workshops that really are geared towards supporting parents um, and being able to nurture that relationship as well as just being kind of that parenting ally. It's such a difficult transition um, in life. and. There's not a ton of resources out there. So my goal, my mission is to kind of be that support out there for parents in the world. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Do you think people, <laughs> people before they have, they, like people that are married with, before they have kids, do you think they anticipate how different things will be after they have children? I think on a high level, there's an awareness or a thought of it. I think part of the difficulty is because our society in general, for whatever reason, is really good at kind of just talking about all of the sunshine and beautifulness about having a family. And so I find that so many um, folks will go into having kids and have this idea that it's going to be just so easy and just so natural to kind of have this kid and bring it into your life. And I think because of that, they are often much more surprised about the difficulties about expanding your family and becoming a parent. Yeah. I felt like I was realistic and prepared, but then I felt like I was a little bit of naive where all the people were like, yeah, yeah, we'll help you. And, and even the, some of the things my husband said, yeah. And, and then when you actually have the baby, you're like, oh, wait, they were just being nice. Mm. and that's a really great point yeah. also yeah but yeah but then you get in the routine and you learn and yeah not to not to be sound daunting to anyone who's out there who doesn't have children yet but yeah it is beautiful but yeah it's, it comes with its challenges and what are some of, oh sorry oh and what are some of the biggest challenges do you find that people come to you with different couples yeah, I think the biggest one that I see is so often because, you know, having having a child, um, it's a lot of pressure to kind of mold this human being. And many parents go into it going, I want to have this human being succeed and thrive. And so we pour so much of ourselves into that child that it almost kind of we get like tunnel vision in a way. And so sometimes we end up neglecting ourselves yeah. um, as well as neglecting any relationships that we kind of have around us, whether it's our parent partner or um, other support systems in our life, because we're just so, and again, it's coming from this really like genuine, authentic place of, I want this person to, to, to succeed and to thrive that sometimes we forget about um, all of the, the extras that are also a part of taking care of the child. Yeah, definitely. I can definitely resonate. That resonates with me. I had to like, remember, like you give so much of yourself in the beginning because it's like they're, they're little creatures and they're absolutely helpless and they're completely dependent on you. But then you also have to remember, okay, I have to take care of myself as well. And I have to cultivate my relationship with my partner and, you know, try to get mm -hmm. a social life. And of course, that for a period, at least for me, I was like realistic that that's this is a season in life where that's not a priority, especially like the first six months to a year. 
But now that my son is two, then you can like start to, <laughs> you know, start to get out the waters a little bit and you're like, okay. Yeah. And I think you're so on point in the fact that there is a natural kind of turning inward, right? When you, when you bring in a child that you're, you're trying to get to know this, this little human. And so there's that natural kind of in inward turning that happens. Um, and I think that's where so many parents, it's hard to then get out of that sometimes because then you kind of become in this habit. And so, um, like you said, yes, they're dependent on you for those, you know, first couple of, of years, absolutely. And in, in a much bigger way. Um, so much so, like you said, we can pour, 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 and sometimes we forget to pour back into our cups. And so then we're, we're at the end and there's like nothing yeah. left and we're struggling with some of that. And so I think that's probably some of the biggest struggles that I see folks come in with, with they've, whether it's they feel like they've lost their own identity or they feel like they've lost um, their relationship with their partner and they're, they feel more like roommates instead of teammates. Right. Yeah. That part I was aware of and I tried to be like, you know, proactive about that part like we, we were. But still, it like happens. You have periods where you're just like so exhausted, <laughs> where you're just trying yes. to like survive. Hundred <laughs> percent. But yeah, everything yes. is just a period, ebbs and flows in life. Yeah. So, what are your three main tips that you would give any couple that are going through a period of that, but they don't see they don't see it as a period. They're maybe afraid that like this is it. How would they come climb out of that period? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of pieces of it for the individual and for the identity. It is really allowing yourself permission that it's okay to kind of step away and to take a breather. And it doesn't define or mean that you're a bad, a quote unquote bad parent for doing those things. You know, as much as it is, you know, kind of cliche when the airline people tell you to kind of put on your own mask before you you reach for your child, there's a very real reason for that is oftentimes, you know, we look at kind of self-care and it, it might feel selfish. Um, but remembering that actually being able to do some of that self-care. And sometimes, like I said, it's just, it's, taking a step back, it's taking a breather, it's taking an actual shower that day, maybe what? for you. And um, it's giving yourself that permission that it's okay to do those things. Because actually, when you step out of that shower, for example, you do have more capacity, I find to actually yeah, be able yeah. to then go back to your child um, and be able to be at maybe a better you than you were before the, the the shower, if you will. And um, so that's that's one that I would definitely say. And then finding those ways to carve out intentional time for your partner. And it doesn't have to be um, 30 minutes, an hour. Sometimes people look at me and they go, I don't have that kind of time in my day. And, you know, let's be realistic. Being a parent can be really, really busy. And so it, it does take some creativity. And so finding those creative ways to connect with your partner, even if it is just for, you know, a six second kiss, being intentional about grabbing your partner and just really giving them that like full six second kiss. I feel like everybody can find six seconds. Right. And even if the baby's crying, six more seconds, they will survive for that that six six second kiss to give to your partner. And it's a way, again, just to really be intentional about connecting and and continuing to build that that relationship with them as well. And then probably the third one is that if you reach out, I guarantee you'll find someone who will go, oh my gosh, I totally feel you on that. Because as much as we don't talk about it, it's actually out there and you're less alone than, than maybe you think you are. And so just give it a try of just, you know, reaching out to a friend or another parent and going, oh my goodness, like, today's a today's a rough day and you might find that they actually relate to you more than you think they would and that it's okay it doesn't mean that you're a horrible parent for saying that today is a rough day it doesn't mean that it's like that always um in fact there's a lot of joy in there um and sometimes we might miss the joy if we're just so stuck in it. So that when we reach out we're able to kind of come up and, and take that breath and be able to see more of that joy yeah, definitely. I love those. Those are like three, like, you know, short, practical <laughs> that anybody can do. And they really work like self-care. Who 
how can taking care of yourself not benefit just not just you but your family as well i'm always like preaching now like self-care isn't selfish it's like one of the best things that you can do for your family and absolutely being intentional about making time with your your partner like it can't be spontaneous like it was when you didn't have kids you have to be a lot more intentional about it so that totally makes sense and i like that cultivating community because that was something that was missing for me and like, like you said, just being more open to like, uh, yeah, share your difficulties and you never know who could, will be open to help you or just support you or listen. So those are definitely some good tips. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to know from your life, because I find this like with a lot of professionals, like me, I'm a dietitian. And as much as I was like preaching, you know, you have to take care of yourself and everything. And then when I had a baby, I was just like grabbing whatever was close. And I wasn't, I was like totally neglecting myself for like the first six months. And I hear like this with a lot of professionals as well, like mindset coaches where, did you ever go through like a rough period in your like relationship or marriage or and like where all of a sudden you realize, oh, I actually have to practice what I preach. Did you experience that? Uh, yes to all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, I absolutely did. I think for me, one of the the biggest um, really barriers, I don't know if a barrier mounted I had to climb, if you will, is um, actually with my first child. And so, you know, I'm I'm brand spanking new to this. Um, I was at the end of my um, my graduate program for my degree, actually. And um, I so I had my child at the end of my program. I was, you know, seeing seeing the end of the tunnel, if you will. And um, while he was about uh, three weeks old, um, I started noticing that he was actually having more more spit up than normal. Um, and and I had worked with kids kids you know, my whole life. In fact, I had always been that person that people would like, you'd be such a great mother. And so that was definitely a narrative that I had in my head when I had my child. And when this started happening at three weeks old, I kept saying, you know, this is, this feels more than spit up. And I would go to the doctors and I would say, I think something's going on here. And all the doctors would just say, no, 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 you're, you're just overreacting. You're a first time parent. You're just being paranoid. Everything's fine. Go home. And so I I allowed that. I allowed that to kind of stop me and to to really question my own instincts. And so I would go home and just say, well, I guess, I guess this is it. Maybe it is just me being, you know, a naive kind of new new mom, if you will. And at about three months old, my child stopped eating altogether. Wouldn't take a bottle, wouldn't take breast, wouldn't take anything. Um, and I immediately went back to the doctor and I said, something is wrong. My child will not eat, absolutely won't eat. And um, they finally paid attention to me because his weight was backing it up. His weight dropped drastically. And all of a sudden they said, oh, you know, it's got to be something more, you know, here, give me the baby. And, you know, I'll show you how to, I'll show you how to feed the child. And I was like, okay, here, like, if you can make my child eat, by all means, at this point, like, I just want my child to eat. And, um, and even, even the doctor couldn't get, get my child to eat. And so at that point, people started listening. And for me, especially with it being related to eating and having that narrative going into it that, oh, you're going to be such a great mom. And eating is, you know, if you're looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, getting food is is base yeah. level, you know. And the fact that I couldn't get my child to eat really, really rocked my world, rocked my narrative of yeah. myself. Um, I mean, the amount of like self-criticism I was having about what that meant about myself, about myself as a parent. Um I mean, I probably on the daily, um, I was just telling myself how much I was a failure um, and just couldn't do this job. And, um, you know, going through that again, I'm I'm knee deep at the end of my my program where I'm here helping people um, be able to give back to themselves and to talk kindly to themselves and to nurture their own mental wellness. And I was just like 
self-flagellation of like all these horrible things to my to myself because Mm -hmm. that was where I was stuck in and so to kind of see see that dichotomy um now looking back on it I mean it is really difficult to to kind of go oh my goodness I can't it's it's unfathomable that I was just that unkind to myself, that lacking in that self-compassion. Um, and it was really difficult to kind of get out of that. Um, but unfortunately, the only way that I was able to um, get food into my child, because the doctor pretty much looked at, looked at me and said, if we can't find a way to to feed your, your child, we're going to have to put, a, put in a feeding tube and, you know, get nutrition in him, whether he likes it or not. And I was just convinced again, kind of that perfectionism. I, this was my job. I needed to be able to figure out how to feed my child. And so, um, I, I, by pure experimentation, um, ended up finding a way to get food into him, but it involved um, what I now know, I didn't know at the time, are called kind of dream feeds, which essentially means that I would rock him right to that brink of right before he was about to fall asleep when instinct was kicking in. And I would um, just get him to to latch. I pretty much just, you know, shoved my breast right on in there and said, here you go. And his instinct of latching, or, you know, it was a very lazy latch because he was sleepy. Um, and then I would hand express, um, milk into his mouth. And again, because he was now at this point, pretty much asleep, um, his body would just naturally swallow. And so I was having to weigh him before I would, before he would go to sleep. Um, and then I would get him to latch right as he was about to fall asleep. I would hand express as much as I I thought that maybe his body needed. And then I would have to carefully without waking baby, (laughs) um, be able to weigh him afterwards, um, just to check to see if he was actually getting food in his belly. Um, and so I had to do that um, all the way up until he was 18 months. So, you know, that whole adage of sleep when baby sleeps, I wasn't able to do that because when baby sleeps, that was the only time I could get food in his body. And so not only was uh, the self-criticism strong for me, um, but the exhaustion, the level of exhaustion was through the roof because I was not sleeping at all for those pretty much those 18 months. Um, And uh if I wasn't home, so if it was one of those days where I did have work um, or I had a class, um, he wouldn't eat. And, you know, my my wonderful, wonderful partner just had to kind of sit there with a starving baby who would not eat um, and trying to trying to care for him while I was gone. And so it was a really, really rough period. Um, definitely some periods of myself kind of going through some disassociation just as a way to try to try to cope. And so. Um, it was very difficult to kind of see those own skills that I was really good at helping other people get to, to kind of apply that, um, for myself. Um, and it took a lot of, um, you know, dialoguing with my parent partner of, you know, giving myself some, some highlight goals. We ended up, um, scheduling a trip with myself and my partner. Um, cause at that point we also wouldn't really leave the house because we needed his sleep to be optimum in order for me to be able to get food into his belly. Um, And he was also still actively vomiting. Um, And so there was a lot of things that kept us isolated. So for us, it was, you know, creating a goal date and we scheduled a trip, whether he was eating at that point or the vomiting had stopped, we didn't know, but we had to give ourselves some sort of something to look forward to. Um, And that was probably the biggest aha for us to kind of get through that of being able to keep we've got this point it's there is an end um to this isolation to this kind of period that we're in and thankfully you know at 18 months it just all sort of stopped um even the doctors still don't know a rhyme or reason to it um but at that point, it definitely took a lot of healing for myself, um, healing with my relationship with my partner. Um, but we were able to to kind of make it through that and um, found our way to the other side. And I have a, a beautiful, thriving child who's you know in in about to go into middle school. So I mean, he's he's lived and and I did it, uh, but it definitely didn't feel like I was going to do it at the time. 
Yeah, and it's crazy how sometimes, like, if your friend, if your best friend told you she was going through that, you would never, like, tell her, you know, it's your fault or it's, Mm -hmm. like, we know these things, but sometimes when it comes to us, it's so hard to, you know, get out of that, especially something so drastic is like, like you said, like your child not eating, where you feel like this, it's like so basic. Why am I not doing this? So I could definitely Mm -hmm. feel like it's not your fault. And you did like, and you were absolutely wonderful to like, not take the doctor's word for it. And like, you know, find a way to actually feed your baby. Like they didn't tell you to dream feed. You figure this out on your own. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that was never mentioned. The only thing, you know, they wanted that that medical intervention and he never ended up having to get a, f- a feeding tube because of um, the choice that I made. And although, you know, as I said, it it had a lot of a lot of pain, a lot of sleepless nights. Um, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, man. Things we do for our babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's something like you mentioned, like when people say, you know, sleep when the baby sleep. That's something that was so like it sounded so easy to me before I had a child. Like, yeah, I'll just sleep in the baby sleeps. But then not even your situation. Your situation was even more crucial. But I just found like I, I like my son just did. He always wanted to be held. And he always he was just like, that's just the type of baby he was. And then when he finally went to sleep. It was just like I was trying to choose, okay, do, what do I do? Do I take a shower? Do I eat? Do I like, check my emails? Do something? So, yeah, it's like so funny to say like, yeah, sleep when the baby sleeps. But that's not realistic for a lot of moms and especially not for a mom like who's going through something like she, you, like you did. So, And I think, again, although many people are well-intentioned, you know, when they're saying these things of, oh, make sure you get some sleep. So sleep when baby sleeps, you know, I, I don't imagine somebody is saying those things to kind of um, give you one more thing to put on your mile long checklist that you already have, right. you know, um, at the same time um, that sometimes there is kind of that lack of mindfulness that maybe it isn't quite as helpful as they're intending um, it to be because it is not their experience. It's your experience. And sometimes you have to find kind of what's going to work for you. And that when these people, these outsiders are kind of offering their unsolicited, you know, thoughts and opinions that, um, that it could just be very, it could be more isolating and um, more lonely than they intend it to be because then when you're looking at it and going, well, that's not my experience. Okay. So am I doing something wrong? Like you're telling me it should look like this, but it doesn't look like this. So, you know, what's wrong with me? I feel like, you know, our instincts are are very easily, we go there. Well, what's, what did I do? You know, what's wrong with me? And so, you know, for those people and when, when I'm working and, and talking to people, I always go, you know, if you're looking to support that, that new parent, go towards asking them what would be most helpful? What do you need in this moment? And letting them lead and really speak up for their needs because then we're we're meeting them. You know, it's still the same intention. I want to be helpful, but it's really what's helpful to them, not what's helpful to you, the outsider. Yeah, because people always think they know what's best for you. Like, even if it's another mom who had children, I don't necessarily need the same thing that you needed as a mom. So like, it's always best to lead with that. I like that advice. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's a great point because honestly, even if it was the same mom, um, each child is so different, right? Right? You you, You could say, you know, oh, this is what worked with my child, but what's the likelihood that what worked for your one kid, if you have multiple kids, that it works for all of them. Right. Is the likelihood is probably pretty Almost slim. Almost never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, no two are, are alike, even even twins, the likelihood that they're going to need different soothing patterns or different eating styles. Like it's probably pretty high. So you always work, you booked with couples and then you started to work with the parents and children. So I actually started out working with adolescents and families, like the whole family system, because, again, I'd grown up just working with kids. And so I always thought, oh, that's where that's where I live. That's my home. That's what I'm comfortable with. And the difficulty that I had with that is, um, especially if the parents didn't have the resources or didn't have the um, exposure to some of these coping skills or some of these, um, you know, 
um, emotional kind of intelligence information and knowledge that I would work with the adolescents and the teenager and maybe the parents would come in every once in a while. And most of the time I was getting, you know, hey, something's wrong with my kid. I really love my kid. Please fix them. And then they would walk out the door. But the difficulty is we could do some really awesome work, but if they're going right back into the same kind of home system and the same structure, it would kind of dissolve. And so I, I sat there. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have a heart of I want to be as helpful as I possibly can. And so I'm sitting there going, this isn't helping. Like it's not, it's not working. And so then I started kind of really figuring out how can I be more preventative? Um, and that's what led me to doing more of the, the parenting and the couple work and focusing on that because so many of these parents also didn't have teachers to be able to teach them. Unfortunately, these are skills that aren't taught in school. We're not taught how to be in a relationship and to be in a healthy relationship. So if you're not seeing that directly modeled because of people that you are fortunate enough to have in your life, you just plain don't get it. Yeah. And so you're going into these relationships as adults and you have no manual because they don't really make one. And so, you know, maybe you're trying to kind of piece together things you've read or things you've heard, but it doesn't because we're all unique, it doesn't always quite fit. And so I really wanted, you know, I, I again, that preventative piece of me was like, I want to get in there and I want to give these parents, I want to give them something to be able to, to thrive themselves with the idea that if we're helping the parents thrive and we're giving them tools, we're giving them knowledge, we're giving them compassion and grace that sometimes they don't give themselves, that the more strengthening in that relationship they'll have, the more capacity they'll have to be able to pay it forward essentially to their children. Because I feel like so many of the parents I work with, that's their end goal. They want to be able to do what's best for their kids. And so when they come into the room and they work on themselves and they work on their relationship, they're learning skills that they go home and they teach their kids, whether it's by modeling it or by directly like coaching them through it. And then the whole family starts to thrive instead of just, you know, in individual pieces of it. It becomes a, a whole family system that's yeah, really kind of moving forward. it sounds like a very forward. holistic approach. And it makes sense yeah. because also the, it doesn't, like, you you can give kids all of the tools, but the parents at the end of the day, they're like, you know, the leaders of the household and they can, if they're not, you know, healed individuals are emotionally intelligent, then that they don't care what they're, they're like, what is my child talking about? <laughs> so yeah. that makes sense, yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, I don't know about you, but the phrase I would hear so much was, you know, do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. The problem with that is kids are so stinking observant. <laughs> they watch everything with we, their little I see eyes. What you do. Exactly. Yeah. Oh <laughs> and so even though you're saying, you know, do what I say, not what I do, they're watching what you do. And so why not? Let's get the parents actual things to do. And now the kids are seeing that what I'm saying is matching what I'm doing. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Let me do that too. Right. I would say that instead of like <laughs> lead by example, or, you know, something maybe like, yeah, just don't do it. Do what I say, but don't like, do, I'm not going to be an example. I'm not a role model. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah. Well, how many of them also didn't have their own role models? I can absolutely appreciate where, again, if, yeah, if you don't true. know any better and, you know, if we're talking about only now are we really getting to the point where mental health is starting to be a serious part of the conversation. And so not only were they not seeing it in their world, but there was less information kind of available. Like if you wanted to go to therapy, you had to especially back, you know, in like my parents' generation, generation before that, you would probably risk getting called like, ooh, you're going to yeah. a shrink. Yeah, like, what does crazy. that mean about you? <laughs> exactly. You yeah. know, so I could, there are so many barriers that, that were out there. Again, not, not to, you know, excuse any of the, the behavior choices that were made um, because we are responsible for our behaviors. I truly believe that um, at the same time, there's, there's so many, um, the accessibility needs to be there. And I think that's on us as a society to be able to make that more accessible. Yeah. That's some, that's some place where we can like extend grace because it was so different. Like all of this that we're talking about now sounds like, you know, crazy talk if we were like comparing it to, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And I like this approach also, like in my field, like as a dietitian, I I remember there was an example where a mother brought her child. I should say I was a dietetic intern. So I was so proud of like how the dietitian that like was mentoring me handled it. And her child actually wasn't, you know, she was going through puberty and maybe she was maybe a little bit overweight, but nothing like worrying or anything that happens to young girls at a certain age. They start to accumulate a little body fat and But this mother, you could tell that she had her own like body dysmorphia issues. And she brought her daughter like, I need her to lose weight. She's getting fat. And she was speaking about her daughter like the daughter wasn't there. She said, your daughter is fine. (laughs) She's she's like a healthy young girl. And I want you to come back for a session. So she had had the mom come back for a session. And and she told me like that she says, like, first of all, when it comes to what your child is eating, especially at a young age, I think this girl was um, 11 or 12, she's not going grocery shopping for the family or anything like the mother is. So that's mm-hmm. also a thing like why you need to talk to the parents. And plus she doesn't like, especially at that gentle age, you don't want to put the mother's issues that she has with her weight and, you know, diet issues onto the girl. So I like how she said, like, we're going to deal with you. You come back for a session and don't come back with your child the next time. But And, and there is a point where you come, like, talk to the children as well. But starting off, like, she wanted to see where the mom's mo- mind space was first. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect example of being able, like you said, kind of that lead by example, because um, there are many ways that um, we can impact as parents, impact our kids' lives that sometimes we're not thinking about those those little pieces, like you said, of the grocery shopping and, and what are we doing when we're going to the grocery store? Because, oh, well, we're getting, you know, these certain aspects or maybe this is how I eat. I'm expecting my child to eat differently. Um yeah but this is what's available (laughs) yeah and so you know it's very similar kind of on the mental health side that um you know we have a choice to make as far as even just like let's talk about emotion regulation you know and being able to to handle those really big emotions because those are real they're going to come up whether you're a child or whether you're an adult and I don't know how many adults I've seen who they themselves you know kind of throw their their tantrums and are right. you know really struggling working through their own big right. emotions and they expect get at the same old. time <laughs> exactly they're like stop crying and they're talking to like you know their two-year-old and it's like Hey, they, they've got big emotions too. And so instead, you know, being able to kind of work through that together and gosh, how much power that could have if your kid is seeing like you as an adult, you as their parent are having a really big emotion and you're having to step away and you're having to do some deep breathing or to walk around the block or to, you know, really do some self-soothing. Now they're looking at that and it's normalizing, being able to work through it, normalizing, stepping away and saying, I need a minute. I want to talk about this. This is really important to me. I want to be at my best capacity. And right now I'm not, I might say things that aren't great or I might choose behaviors that are not serving this relationship. And you're worth it to me to to walk, to go take a breath because I want to come back to this relationship and really feed it instead of draining it. And gosh, to model that for your kids. And then they see that happening. And then it's empowering them to go, hey, my my dad could do that. My mom can do that. And that's okay. Hey, I can do that too. And then all of a sudden your kids are going, yeah, you know what? I need to take a break. And they're like, cool. Great job. Great job knowing where your body was at right now. Wow, I love that. Yeah, like like you mentioned before, like we model that behavior and then they'll see it and it'll reflect to them and they'll know that that's how you behave. And just not that's and I can take that to like so many examples which you explain right now. Just trying to model, be on your best behavior <laughs> so your kids will know how to behave. And I know sometimes we don't like not all people have the tools to do that, but that's why they can work with someone like you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And get those and tools. Think, yeah. And even on that, like when we're not on our best behavior, because we're human, we're going to mess up being able to have that humility to go even to our kids to come back and say, you know what? I screwed up. I made a mistake. I'm really sorry that I overreacted. And then again, I know that so many parents that I've seen that I've worked with, you know, for them, there's this narrative that if they say sorry to their child or if they, they show their kids that they're having a hard time, that it's it's a weakness or it's a deficit um, to them. 
when in fact, honestly, it makes you so much more human and so much more relatable. And then it also teaches your kids they are worth an apology from their parents. Like if my own parents are saying I'm worth it to apologize when they mess up, like, hey, other people, when they treat me poorly or when they, you know, insult me or whatever they do, I also deserve an apology from them. Like, hey, you know, so being able to see that as, you know, it's it takes a lot of, of vulnerability to go back to our kids. It's not a weakness. In fact, it takes so much strength to be able to say, I messed up, you yeah. know, to this little human and say, But that's so know, empowering to them too. And I'm just thinking about, when they get in romantic relationships, it'll raise their standards about how you communicate and you know, all of yeah, all of that. Having someone apologize, not accepting every behavior. I think that's so important to cultivate that, especially when they're young. Yes, it is. And like you said, it it pays off in the future. So it may feel really hard <laughs> when you're in it. But gosh, the the payoff for them, like if that is truly the goal for for them to be thriving human beings, um, believe me, it does it does pay off um, for them in the end. Because like you said, they can't go into future relationships, um, whether it's with the partner or when they decide to have kids, if they decide to have kids of their own, that they can continue that. And we're passing on that generational healing instead of the generational trauma being passed on yeah so what i got from this is parents before they you know they need to focus on their self-healing it's not just like automatically the child <laughs> they think about what their their mindset is is like and then also you talked about leading by example um mirroring mm -hmm. what child the behavior that you want your children to to exemplify and then the third one you know it's okay to be vulnerable and apologize oh. to your children and, you know, and just it set a certain standard because that's like a standard that they'll take to their future relationships and when their parents may be in the future. Yes, and, and absolutely. So. That is hopefully my goal. And so, you know, I welcome any parents that are struggling, you know, um, if if they're needing that extra support, you know, to to be able to come on by and, and I will help them judgment free because I've I've messed up myself. And so I want it to be a safe space so that you can get vulnerable and you can get honest about kind of your own baggage and being able to kind of let's heal some of that. So then, like you said, be able to to heal that for, for our kids as well. Yeah. And I feel like you expressing the hardships that you went through makes it a, you, even a more well-rounded professional because you've been through something. It's not like everything was just like perfect all the time. So you can understand the pain points of, you know, some parents that come to you or children. So that even makes, in my eyes, makes you a, like a, even a better expert. I hope so. I like to I say like, I get it. I, I, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I like to end off the, these episodes with talking about like a self-care practice or something that you have. Do you have something like that in your life? It doesn't have to be like for some people, it's just like, I don't know, a bath, a walk, or maybe it's something more extravagant. But share that to inspire some mom to take care of herself today. So I I love and I've now passed it down to my kids. Um, I love a dance party. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so for me, um, music has been a big piece in helping me heal. It's one of the ways that I decompress from my work um, before I go home so that I'm making sure work is work and home is home um, is I love listening to music. And so um, one of the things that that we do in our house when any one of us is just struggling is we just turn on a, a really like upbeat song and we just dance like whatever dance comes to our mind we just sometimes it's just shaking your body like a fish <laughs> but it's just dancing it out and you dance for the entire song and by the end of it everyone's kind of giggling and laughing because it's silly and you're feeling the music and sometimes we leave we start with one song, but it ends up going for, you know, a whole hour. We're not necessarily dancing for the whole hour, but the music stays on and the the joy and the being able to kind of take that breath and lighten things up with some humor and ease that tension is is one of my favorite things to do. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. I'm, I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> <laughs> my son loves to dance anyway like we also listen to music but I like that making it like a moment each day <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 
So I love dance parties. That's that's dance my party. little tidbit. It's it's not necessarily uh, scientific or you know yeah. monumental, but I I love a good dance party. A good dance party, <laughs> music cues. <laughs> yes, and I like that transition, making a transition from like work to home, <laughs> having something mm-hmm. that like marks that. Absolutely. I think it it is very important for many people. Um, again, thinking about parents, especially if you're you're a working parent or you've just had a really rough day, um, sometimes it can be really easy for us to bring that home with us. Um, even in you know, subconsciously. Um, and so finding a way to kind of really go, you know what, I'm I'm choosing to kind of walk through these doors with a different mindset. And so whatever works for you. And so for me, like I said, it, it is that music. And sometimes it's my girl, you know, the power girl ballads that I just like have blasting <laughs> as I'm like driving home. And I've like, sometimes I'm singing along with it. And by the time I get home, I'm like, okay, let's go. And, you know, I walk through mm. the door. I love that. Okay. Well, <laughs> this has been such a great conversation. Can you tell people where they can find you, where they can connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on my website, um, which is EmbraceRenewalTherapy.com. Um, or I'm also on TikTok, on Instagram, also at Embrace Renewal Therapy. So it's it's all the same, all consistent. Um, and like I said, there you'll be able to find out um, any of my services. I do provide therapy services um, for all of the state of California. And then I do workshop services um, nationwide. Awesome. So I'll make sure everything is linked in the show notes. Thank you so much, Marissa. Thank you. This was fun. Yes. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate uh, what you're doing and the message and mission that you have for your show. So thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you. And this is ticket talking mazza for the biggest. That's a comma and a comma and a comma. Gotta get it, get it. And this is ticket talking mazza for the biggest. That's a comma and a comma and a comma. Gotta get it.